Good morning, everyone. Let's see. So to, today I have a couple of agendas. Okay, so since I have a minute left before the class starts, so uh, I, I miss the chit chat. I mean, so occasional chit chat from the students on um, not relevant to the classes. Uh, when I uh, either come to campus before the class, uh, I mean, in the classroom, on the way to the classroom, I miss those days, uh, most of, miss those chit chats. Uh, I guess you miss uh, hanging out with your buddies. Uh, so, uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Perfect. So uh, today is, uh, okay, so that's a lot of notification. How to stop these notifications? No way. Okay, so uh, And can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, the quality of the screen share is not good. Uh, so we can screen document stop. I, what you did before worked, I could see the screen. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, let me just go back. Stop share. I'm just worried about the quality of the screen share. This is a different device. Uh, let me find the one. It's the No. No mind. Let me do a different screen share. The technology. Oh. Where is that thing? Okay. Now, can you see the browser? Uh, this is actually your Canvas browser. And uh, as you can see, uh, if you go into the syllabus, let me just quickly go through that. I mean, it's, it's much clearer that I can, I can tell. So, uh, so the very first agenda today is about uh, Safe return, our first hybrid session on week two, which is next week, Tuesday, uh, at, at the at the class period. So the next class, uh, you'll see me uh, from campus, and as you can see, uh, let's go. So this is week one. We are on the second class of week one. Uh, we've been so the next class Tuesday. If I can zoom in a little bit, so the Tuesday this is hybrid session. Uh, 
this is essentially uh, going to be an introduction to the deep tracer essentially uh, not totally on the hardware thing actually uh, maybe you have uh, read the announcement that i made it clear i tried to make it clear that it is not required that you come to campus uh, to get the hands on experience with the deep tracer thing uh, everything uh, that i will be teaching uh, this this class uh, it can be uh, how to say uh, done virtually i mean from remote location so it's it's, it's totally fine if you miss the class uh, everything will be broadcasted very similar to the way that you are attending this so you will see uh, see, see that uh, but again uh, so that's one uh, announcement so and for the hybrid session actually in the syllabus I pointed out a couple of things maybe go through the syllabus one more time and uh, yes so so flexible and safe return to campus there are some guidelines university provides can you see the screen of the browser no yes the safe return to campus page okay so so click on that link and see actually here so if you plan on coming uh, to meet for the for the class the hybrid session next tuesday uh, read this page carefully. So here, I'd like to point out that you need to first uh, go through the training. This is an online uh, Skillsoft training before you come to the campus, okay? So it's an online training and at the end of the training, these are a couple of uh, really good safety guidelines uh, that uh, university provides and uh, you need to know that. So you just, go take the training and at the end of the training you will you can obtain the certificate and take that certificate with you it can be saved in a smartphone or maybe uh, i have a printout but again so this is just one time i mean for this whole entire semester you just need this completion certificate and carry that all time if you arrive uh, if you plan on coming to the campus okay so that's it and we are not going to be coming daily right so this is one of the eight hybrid classes is going to be on on and not every one of them is going to coming on on the eight classes so i decided to split the entire class into two groups so most likely you will be assigned to come uh, one of the four classes okay so the remaining 20 is going to join in the next four classes oh boy so let's see so there's something going on okay uh give me just a second so technology again i'm sorry these are the catch maybe easy easy this way i have an external camera plugged in but maybe it's it's easier if i do it from my laptop okay where where so uh, again, so now if you'd like to planning, so while on campus, uh, always bring your face covering uh, indoors and outdoors and uh, you need to actually in the training, you will see actually a couple of uh, entry points. Uh, for example, the health screening stations where you need to first show up. Uh, otherwise you won't be allowed to go into any any of the build building. So the health screening might, I mean, allow minimum 30 minutes. So a buffer of 30 minutes because it, it might take a while because maintaining the safe distance between you and the previous person, uh, uh, getting the health screening, then might, you, you are expected to see a queue. Uh, so, and also it, it, I mean, the queue is definitely maintained six feet or more distances to get you safe and uh, at the end of the screening you will get a wristband for a day and that wristband is a mandatory thing to show if you'd like to enter any building in the campus including where you are going to be coming uh, uh, next next week so so read this page carefully so that's uh, uh, my goal to keep you safe and also keep myself safe.
I don't want to get sick uh, or anything. So, uh, and also I'll try to make sure this is my responsibility too, to keep you safe. So uh, I'll try best not to come close to you during the lecture. And also uh, actually as an instructor, uh, you will see actually in the training, uh, they mentioned not to move <laughs> uh, during lecture, uh, not to be a dynamic uh, mover during the lecture. And also I'd like expect the same that you just to have a discussion with your friend who is sitting next to you. Actually, there's gaps. You, you'll notice that in a classroom in the Lawrence Street, there are Cap the capacity is more than 25 students, but only seven are allowed. So when the classroom capacity is filled, um, if seven students get in, uh, you will be escorted to go to the next classroom, which is actually I have uh, three classrooms available at that time. So if 20 students shows up uh, on Tuesday, I can ac accommodate them very safely. If more than 20 comes, uh, maybe you need to sit somewhere uh, safe uh, in the campus, maybe in a field where you will have the UC Denver Wi-Fi network and just join remotely, okay? Uh, so with that said, actually, uh, let's see. Uh, where did I do this? Okay, so, uh, so if you go to, Probably now you can see the people uh, button, uh, people link in the canvas. So if you go to the canvas, see people and you will find the hybrid group. I created a hybrid group. There are two groups. So if you see these, you're gonna see that, uh, so I created hybrid one and hybrid two groups. Right now, 21 students each. Uh, so just see actually which group you belong to. I mean, uh, these are all random assignments. I, I didn't uh, drag and drop things. So Canvas has a uh, randomization algorithm to uh, randomly select uh, the group. So this is hybrid one. So if you are listed in this hybrid one group, uh, so you're expected to show up uh, next Tuesday. And uh, so if you belong to hybrid two, you remain home, you stay at home next Tuesday, watch uh, remotely. And your turn is gonna be coming, uh, it is listed in the syllabus in the schedule. It will be two weeks from next week. Okay, so, so that's it. So just find yourself uh, which group that you belong to and, uh, and all, not all 20 uh, from each group is gonna sitting in the same classroom. I will, I will actually, once you show up, I will assign you uh, which classroom to go to. So there are three classrooms I have at that time of the class. So you don't worry about uh, keeping safe distances. So I can, I can make sure of that. But again, one more time, if you feel unsafe, uh, if you are not comfortable coming into the campus, I totally understand. And also there is no, your grade is gonna, not gonna be affected. Uh, and also I will not teach anything special uh, if you are coming on campus. So there is no cheat, uh, cheat sheets that I'll provide to the on-campus students uh, that they will get benefit. So no, uh, it will be totally fair. I'll try my best to maintain that uh, standard. So. Uh, with that said, so that's my first announ announcement uh, today. Any question? No? Nope. Actually, yes, one question. Please, go. Go ahead. Can you update the syllabus page with which hybrid group will be attending or has the option to attend on each day? Okay, perfect. So, yes, I I'm going I'm to do that. Uh, but for now, maybe before I do that, I'll, I'll do that right after the class, after two classes, I have back to back one. Uh, so after 2 p.m. I'll try uh, to pause that. Uh, but uh, since actually uh, this is a list of names and I'm not allowed to disclose the names in, in, a, uh, in a file or something that is that can be shared. So I encourage you to 
check in Canvas, if you can see the people's link and also the group, uh, that would be, I mean, more easy and more, uh, how to say, safer way for me, not disclosing names uh, to the community or something. So that's a FARPA that I need to maintain. But anyway, uh, if you don't know your group name, uh, you can just shoot me an email. I mean, in a in Canvas inbox, I'll I, I can tell you what group you belong to. Okay. Well, my question is actually, can you update the syllabus to say which days are for hybrid one and which days are for hybrid two? Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, yes. That's that's actually what is missing. Okay. So I I planned on so it's a alternating weeks i mean it's alternating two weeks so the first week hybrid one so the next so fourth week probably uh, if you take a look at the syllabus so i'll, I'll definitely annotate that but any, anyway so i just want to make sure what i'm gonna do uh, so let's see so say here this is hybrid one first group so after two weeks this is gonna be so in september 8 so the second group is gonna show up. So after two weeks, this is again hybrid one. So I'll, I'll try to alter uh, this. Uh, so, but anyway, I'll, I'll annotate that uh, in the syllabus. But thanks for the question. Any, any other question? On the syllabus, some of the days uh, are incorrect, as in uh, the day says Tuesday, but uh, the date says uh, Monday uh which one all or can you just uh, add some some of the thing i can't access canvas at the moment so okay so uh if you see that say a week five or week four this is from monday to friday the duration is monday to friday and so this is tuesday so this is the date of the class and this is the Thursday. So if you I see any inconsistency, please let me know. I'd, I'd really appreciate uh, the correction. I believe it's, uh, uh, I believe I saw it during uh, the, uh, which days uh, we have on campus, part of the syllabus. So here in the list, these days? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll double check. Let me. Dates and groups. Yep. Thank you for the question. Any uh, any other question? Good. Uh, so that's my first pointer. Second agenda before I start my lecture. It's already eighteen minutes past. But anyway, so this is very important. Uh, that I mentioned about safe return on campus and hybrid session uh, so that you, you guys get a good feeling uh, and comfortable, be comfortable staying enrolled in this, in this course. Uh, the second point is a, is a formality. Uh, if you click on quizzes, you will find a new quiz uh, showed up. It's called the prerequisite assessment quiz. There are probably you'll see five questions. Nothing is graded. This is a formality uh, to know actually your, uh, I mean, whether you're a grad student, undergrad student, actually, I'll, I'm gonna create, uh, uh, sorry, there's a couple of questions that you'll see that comes from the prerequisite courses. Say for example, algorithm or programming or calculus or something. So since there are five questions, you'll see one from each. Uh, two from each so yeah, take a look at that uh, and the deadline is today by midnight so you can it's five questions so just click 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 and done uh, I, I probably did not put any uh, correct answers to that because if, if I ask you a question that are you a graduate student or maybe uh, actually there is no correct answer to that right there, there are undergrad students in this course and also there's probably there's some uh, students auditing this course as well. Uh, so, okay, so uh, 
so that's the thing. So I expect you wrap this up. I mean, you just finish this as uh, soon as possible. The third agenda is uh, an opportunity for the undergrad students. Uh, so here, uh, you might have heard about the Eureka. Uh, this is a research assistant position uh, in university and I both support financially to the students who will apply. Uh, so actually for this particular uh, semester, actually uh, I'm hosting a cyber, cyber learning technology development tool development. I mean, cyber learn, learning technology development uh, project. And uh, whoever is going to be applying for this uh, is going to be become an Eureka research assistant. And it's paid. Uh, you can just shoot me email or messages uh, to know it, know more about that. Uh, or I mean, also you can ask uh, Eureka the the university, and I, I can provide links to that. Also, uh, and. Let, let, let me know if you're interested in this position. What you need to do, is, what you need to know is programming, Python programming, probably, and again, yeah, and that's it. So if you know Python programming, if you know how to debug, um, you're, you're good to go. So yeah, I just wanted to share because I'm hosting that uh, particular position, I'm sponsoring that particular position, so uh, I need students, I need undergrad students. Uh, so yeah. That's about it before the lecture begins. Any, any question before uh, I jump into the lecture slides? No? OK. Uh, so This is always troubling with switching back and forth, but anyway. I don't need that right now. So probably yeah. uh, reinforcement learning lecture two. Okay. Uh, let's see the full screen. Okay. Can you see the screen that I shared? Anybody? Um, the screen is visible, but it's all blurred and it's, I can see that you're sharing. Yeah. It's, it's is looks it good blurred now. still? No, it looks good it's now. It's better now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Okay, so thank you for confirming that. And anytime if you see any glitch or uh, issue, please let me know. So uh, let's dive into a little details about, uh, let me see if I can write anything. Yeah, okay. So uh, today we'll, Actually, we'll start talking about, and uh, if, you, if you see, there's 105, actually, total 76 slides. Uh, so we're not going to be finishing that today. Uh, so this is a starting of the lecture, actually, what is reinforcement learning all about? Uh, this is a different learning paradigm of machine learning. So we talked about previously, or we talked about what is a supervised learning actually machine learning has many different learning paradigms so in a supervised learning actually uh, what you teach is what you get i mean so if you teach and also tell that this is good example this is bad example this is good example bad example so uh, so the machine learning model the algorithm will know i mean it will learn a pattern that oh boy my supervisor is uh, saying this is good and this is these are bad these are good so uh, you will inherently find a pattern that maybe if the pattern exists then uh, maybe he meant good example if it is it doesn't then it is a bad example so you need to train 
So that particular supervised learning model, uh, supervised agent, uh, a lot of, of these examples so that it can understand the pattern rather than memorizing it, right? So there is a concept called overfitting problem. So if you, uh, if the number of examples is five, so if you know uh, there is only five examples from each, the algorithm will, so if, since we are using advanced algorithms, most of the algorithms uh, takes up a lot of memory and also we afford, uh, so these days we afford computational po power and also memory, hard drive and RAM. So what would happen is it will memorize those 10 examples, five examples each from his class. But uh, so what would happen is, uh, so if given a new example, uh, it will fail because it just, it didn't learn the pattern. It learned, it memorized that if this is exactly this, maybe the question number one. So similar, I mean, back to uh, the days when in high school or school, uh, in, in class or lecture, uh, you were taught some concept, right? Uh, some math problem or some science problem, right? I mean, uh, if you memorize them, so what would happen in the, in the exam, you are not expected to see the same test, I mean, same, same questions which was answered in the classes, right? So you need to learn the concept, learn the patterns, right? So if you memorize them, uh, you will definitely gonna fail. Uh, so that's what we in the machine learning uh, region, we, we call it overfitting. So the model overfits. Uh, and it's a, it's a really, really nasty problem uh, to see because uh, in, in the, during the training, during the learning, it, it performs really well. It doesn't miss anything. But uh, once when the test comes, it, it, it performs really, really poorly. Uh, why? Because of that memorization problem. So that's supervised learning. So uh, the supervisor is teaching the machine learning algorithm to, uh, to learn patterns. This is expected. And, uh, and the next uh, learning paradigm is called unsupervised learning, where actually we, we, the supervisor is giving it data, the set data samples. So, but it is not saying that this is a good example, this is a bad example. I mean, it is not saying anything. I mean, it's just fits in the data, that's it. So, I mean, a typical uh, type of problem that a machine learning or a kid, actually, I, I uh, drew an analogy of, of learning, uh, toddler learning uh, to, to match shapes, match colors, uh, actually group items uh, based on color, based on shape, uh, based on many things. I mean, so, and also it's highly related uh, in that region. So grouping, uh, clustering. So this is the area, this is the second uh, category of learning, uh, which we call unsupervised learning. There is, a, there is, a, there is another learning paradigm, it's called semi-supervised learning. Uh, semi-supervised learning is, so as, I mean, again, uh, let me go back a little bit. So semi-supervised and unsupervised. You, you now know, I, I expect that you are aware of this, uh, two already. So supervised learning, you, you are feeding a lot of samples with labels, positive label, negative label. So it is all labeled. The, and we, we call those label ground truth. That means you know, the supervisor knows what it is feeding. And unsupervised learning, we don't, we have the data, the samples, but we don't know the labels. Uh, so, and, and then the, the semi-supervised learning, if you if you are into a situation like say we are we, I mean there is a, we have a bounty full of samples say for example a million samples but we don't have labels for each and every one of them so maybe maybe uh, we, in the in the million data samples maybe we have labels we know as a supervisor we know maybe we know ten thousand data samples are labeled so. So the remaining big data set, unlabeled data set, uh, what we're gonna do about it? So if you'd like to do classification, maybe uh, uh, learn the pattern, uh, I mean, whether the data sample is positive or negative. So how, I mean, sh sh I mean since supervised learning algorithm needs data with labels, and we have 
plenty of data samples not having labels. So shall we throw them out? It's a big data, right? I mean, uh, although unlabeled, nothing, I mean, useful for the supervised learning algorithm because supervised learning algorithm, again, needs those labels, tags, right? So, uh, so in that case, semi-supervised learning algorithm to, I mean, to come to rescue, right? So you want to use all the data set available in the, uh, in, in this particular scenario. So, uh, so in the super, I mean, so what in a semi-supervised learning algorithm, so you have a limited data set having labels, right? So that 10,000 samples I'd mentioned about that. Uh, so you use supervised learning algorithm to build the model first. So this is the first rudimentary model and use that model, I mean, use that learner uh, to predict on the remaining huge data sample, which are unlabeled. So that means, imagine you use the model to predict what is gonna be the label for the, the rest remaining data set. Now you have labels for each and every one of the data samples, each, or each one of the million data samples, right? Now, come back and use the entire data set. Now you know all the labels, so you, you can again feed the supervised learning algorithm to, to learn it, right? So that's semi-supervised learning algorithm. So it's half supervised, half unsupervised. Um, uh, yeah. prof professor, I had one question. So in this semi-supervised way, instead of using a classifier, uh, which is a classifying, cli sorry, classifier model trained on the labeled data and then using it on the unlabeled data, uh, can we also use like clustering the, uh, the whole data and then labeling uh, the unlabeled data similar as to the label data in the same cluster? Yeah, I mean, that's a good idea. I mean, uh, you can do, since you have a big data set without any labels, uh, I mean, if there is no label in a data set, our, I mean, intuition is to use unsupervised learning, right? So to find the clustering, right? Do the clustering algorithm or unsupervised machine learning, uh, you go that way. But again, uh, uh, I mean, at the end, the clusters, somebody needs to label them, right? Uh, so that's the catch there. So if you have time, I mean, if you, so, I mean, you need to do the, uh, how to say, uh, the finding or annotating all these uh, clusters, memberships of the data. So that's one uh, big challenge if you'd like to do unsupervised uh, and then come back, do the supervised, uh, learning algorithm to build a classifier. So that's the issue with uh, the approach that you just mentioned. So we don't want to use, so in a semi-supervised learning algorithm, we don't want to, I mean, there's not gonna be any human involvement. I mean, so you have the data, some labeled, some unlabeled, and uh, the unlabeled data is gonna be labeled automatically by the machine learning algorithm, which is trained by the labeled data set. And once the unlabeled data are labeled by your algorithm, you again uh, feed the entire data set, labeled data set uh, to the algorithm. So that's the semi-supervised learning algorithm. So, and the next uh, learning paradigm is reinforcement learning. So it's, uh, let's see, okay. So maybe it's easier if I... So I have a question. Yep. Uh, won't that make any sort of some sort of bias? Like I have some data, I use that one to train the rest of data. So it seems like I'm kind of extrapolating the same thing, uh, sort yeah. of, not exactly. So the, in, in the same supervised learning algorithm, uh, yes, this is inherently correct. What you just mentioned, because uh, from the intuition or the patterns of the mm -hmm. ten thousand sample, we are essentially, essentially extrapolating our knowledge uh, to to predict a huge data set, uh, which, I mean, those 10,000 cannot, might not be representative of the entire population. So it is correct that, uh -huh. yeah, it, we will definitely encounter bias, biases. Uh, so and there's many ways uh, to resolve that issue. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there's, uh, uh, how to say it? So data uh, I mean, distribution uh, technique, I'll, I'll I can throw some information maybe later to Kuntal. 
to because to I think that if you have like one of these data sets, the small ones, and you are trying to train the rest of the data set, and then use the whole data set to train the model. So it seems like we are actually using that 10,000 ones to train the whole data set with some so, no noises. Yes. With, with some, uh, I mean, uh, so definitely, so again, uh, one more time is uh, the, the learned model uh, with the 10,000, the smaller data set. Uh -huh. And we use that learned model to predict the levels of the rest of the uh, data set. The big data set I, might not be imp might not be perfect. Yes. Yeah. So the thank you. I don't know if this adds context, but like I just had a conversation with someone about doing this technique. In an ideal world, you have a data science team that like nine people that can go through and tag all of your data. But this mm -hmm. often case isn't available to everyone. So if you're a singular researcher and you have some data labeled, that's all you could do yourself. But you're trying to project at a bigger object. This is the best mm -hmm. you can do, and you can still get very meaningful uh, predictive models and, and interpretation from your data doing it this way. No, it's not as good as having every single data labeled, but this is often like a compromise that has to happen in the real world. Yeah. I mean, rather than throwing out the large amount of unlabeled no, no. data, we're just <laughs> using them <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so that's the point of semi super. That's the motivation behind semi supervised learning, not I mean, reducing the data set, incorporating uh, the pattern, the variance uh, present in those data sets. So that's the right. semi-supervised learning algorithm. Yeah, at least the, at least the words problems. will change. The words will change at least, depending on the number of uh, occurrences. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Uh, I'm like, the, at least the weights, the weightage will change uh, depending on the number of occurrences of each of the levels. Yes. So that's going to change at least. Precisely, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, uh, any any other? I have a doubt. I have a doubt. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to a real data, the issue is like uh, when we try to classify the model either by supervised or unsupervised, there are uh, issues that uh, uh, the data come under each classification are somehow same. So, how we can like make that data uh, to be like a uh, to create a proper target column or to make the machine to uh, algorithm to learn properly like okay differentiate if both the classifications have equal like same attributes yeah if if that question uh, it's not clear but again uh, could you please just uh, give an example uh, for example, if you if you are just trying to differentiate between cat and dog, uh, mm -hmm. just an example, but both have some same feature somehow. So the when we try to find the uh, true positive cases and false positive cases, both are like equally. Uh, ultimate goal to train a model is to give more true positive than any other thing, uh, right? Like it should not have more false positive. Then it, it's going the model is not trained properly. That's how we come to a conclusion. So, but when I try to train a real-time data with an, any algorithm, be, be it's a supervised or unsupervised, what if my data has the same attribute, like same condition for both the classifications? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely we'll be using the same number of features if that is your question. So same, the same variable. So if, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that maybe later uh, more. So we'll, we are not changing the feature space uh, in any way. Uh, both the labeled and then the unlabeled data. We'll be using the same number of features. Okay. So that's... like you told, we will train first half and then we'll try to make the other data to learn from that train and then we'll give to algorithm. So what if the trained uh, uh, data already has the uh, same attributes like the other classification too in the untrained and everything got mixed up? example if you have to for particular data it should be one but the other data should be zero but the way i train the first model makes the dark the classification which comes under zero also as one then how i can differentiate that mm. no it's uh it's not like that uh let me see if i can uh can this uh, can this be a case of overfitting no, because we are essentially adding more data. So this is very unlikely that the model is going to overfit. So you were talking about semi-supervised learning, right? In the semi-supervised learning, it's uh, tend to encourage uh, getting rid of the overfitting issue. 
because we're I mean adding more data to that over I mean uh, adding more data will definitely reduce the chance of getting overfitted uh, but again uh, no, uh, like just like uh, what, what I'm trying to ask is that what if there is a case of class imbalance in that case would there be an overfitting of the data like to a particular class Like in case of a class imbalance, maybe she had a model that actually had a lot of dog pictures that say, let's say dog is one and cat is zero. And she had a model, like she trained the model with a lot of dog pictures. Mm -hmm. And then like you had like, let's say hundred dog pictures for every 25 pictures of cats. So in that case, it will be a clear case of class imbalance. And probably when she's trying to test that with another, uh, like a new set of data where there's actually equal number of cats and dogs, but then the model has actually been trained to a lot of dogs than cats. So yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, okay, so yeah, that's, that's a good point. Actually, now I understand what uh, Kirutika's uh, yeah. question was. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I mean, that's, that's the first problem. So the, in the semi supervised learning, so the first part is to uh, let me, I'm not sure whether can you see if I write something so let's see yes okay so semi supervised learning uh, so you have a data set and uh, let's use a so this is a data set and I tend to use matrix form, right? So you have samples. So samples one, sample two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So you have n samples, and each of these samples has features, variables, we, we call them. Say, for example, uh, so here, say feature one, feature two, feature three and if you consider this so a feature what is a feature or attribute or a variable in in a data set uh, can anybody share I mean uh, talk about that what are features of a sample say you have M features uh, it's gonna be your uh, it's gonna be dependent variables so if it was a supervised learning, you would have independent variables and dependent variables. Independent variable is your ground truth and your dependent variables are going to be, I believe, your features. No, it's the opposite. I'm sorry. Oh, Daniel, so but flip anyway. it, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, other way around. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, the, the variables, the features for every sample that you can see here. So the sample one is described by these features. So you can consider them as attribute of that particular sample. Say, uh, so a feature one can be, say, if it is a person, so it can be age. What is the age of that person? Uh, what is the educational background of that? Uh, so a feature two can be educational uh, attainment, say high school, school. So these are some of the categories. So, you know, so these features describes that sample. So, and you put them together in a, in a row, that becomes this row vector describes the sample, first sample. Now you go to this next sample. Now the third sample and so on and so forth. This is actually how we will describe the data set. And uh, the data set actually, uh, you have the target. So, so this is what we call the ground truth labels. That means we know the answers, right? So in a semi-supervised situation actually why we need the semi-supervised when we have plenty of unlabeled data so here you see that so maybe a fraction of the data is uh, is labeled so we know this is positive this is negative this is positive negative but we don't know anything about a lot of them right so we'll be using these data samples uh, say maybe if I'm just 10,000 samples and these are million. Okay, so this is 1 million. So now it becomes 900,000. Oh no, 990,000, right? And here, 10K. 
So we'll use, we'll use these 10K samples to train the model. Now, actually the goal is to eliminate the bias. Uh, uh, Oshin uh, and uh, Kirutika uh, were, were pointing out that if the model, so the supervised, so the, we'll first build this first uh, supervised learning learner using only this part, right? Uh, is this, okay. So using this data set, right? Okay. And uh, once the model is trained, and we'll predict these values, so these question marks, I mean the target labels for the remaining 990,000 data samples. So, okay. so, but again, the, the first concern was if this particular model is already biased, then we're essentially adding bias in the target labels of the data set, right? Of the unlabeled data set. So how we can resolve that? We, we, we can resolve here in the first model that we are building using uh, the smaller data set by adding, I mean, by balancing out the data. I mean, so if there's a, if the data distribution of positive and negative, so number of uh, positive sample and number of negative sample, if this is like, say, if it is, so in the 10,000K, maybe if, it, if this is 50, and this is the rest, 10K minus five, 50, it's, a, it's really skewed, right? So what we do uh, to balance the data is uh, to oversample the positive sample, to create a balance. Oversample means, I mean, you can definitely re re repeat the same data samples, uh, I mean, in a way that, will amplify the number of positive samples to, uh, to match. And then you feed to the machine learner, the supervised learner. I mean, it, it won't be, I mean, uh, affected by that bias, uh, the number of samples, number of uh, positive and negative bias that you can see. And now you can apply it to label, relabel uh, the ground, um, the unlabeled data set. And now you, once you have labels for each, maybe this is a prediction. So after you do prediction, you'll get say, maybe this is plus, this is minus, this is plus. Okay, I, I'm gonna use different color. So maybe use, so this is plus, this is minus, minus, plus, minus. This is essentially a prediction by the model that you trained here, right? Okay. So now you, all the samples are labeled. Done. Okay, so now you feed another supervised learner uh, using the entire data set, entire label data set. There, there you go. We oh, didn't okay. throw out any sample. So that's the beauty of semi-supervised learner. I believe, I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, any, any question so far? Yeah, I got, I got a point like how this semi-supervised learning works, but uh, since I was working on a real-time data that wasn't like working on the actual algorithm that we are currently using or used when, so I don't know how to explain, but uh, there I uh, end up, ended up with the, these problems where uh, the model was predicting even the positive one as a negative one, a negative one, one as a positive one. And when I try to change the target column by either providing the condition by myself or asking the model to learn by itself using an unsupervised, like it's getting merged. So I thought like which algorithm would be the right one to go on with the data which has the same attributes and values for both the classification be it a positive or negative okay so uh maybe uh w w you and i can talk maybe later uh yeah sure uh, just this is a special c c scenario i i can yeah. see with, with the data yeah. that you are experiencing but anyway thank you for bringing this uh, issue and it's very yeah. important that uh, <laughs> we know about that and uh, for you maybe uh, we get to know semi supervised learning a little better. Yeah, thank you. Sure, thank you. Okay, thank so you, sure. uh, so this is the, I mean, uh, so we talked about some supervised learning. We talked about semi super, I mean, unsupervised learning, and we talked about semi supervised learning. That's not the topic for this course, right? Uh, unfortunately, but anyway, so this this the the understanding will help. Uh, how to say, uh, dive in or know the reinforcement learning a little better. So in the reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, the, the, the point here is, let me see if I can, 
Okay, so the point here is we don't have any data. So beforehand, I mean, uh, so that, that's the beauty of reinforcement learning is uh, there is no headache of collecting data. Uh, so if you can see the slide that I shared. So here you see that uh, there is a learning agent. So this is the learner that we'll build. Uh, it has functionality. Okay, so functionality, I mean, don't always consider this is a robot or a hardware thing, okay? So it, it can be a software. Uh, it can do things, it can interact with the system or, I mean, see, and the environment, so that means it, it does act, right? So this is a action. Agent takes an action into the environment where it sits in. I mean, so, so in the environment is also is a, an abstract concept. I mean, you can you, you get to design your environment in a real world scenario. So maybe the uh, hybrid, uh, how to say now, uh, the deep racer thing. Actually, the the environment is the track, right? The physical track. Uh, in a uh, how to say in a video game scenario, maybe uh, the environment that you design. Okay, so it's like all a lot of graphical uh, user. I mean, graphical in the environments. Uh, already are out there. You, you, actually, I will introduce a lot uh, this semester. The open AI uh, thing, they, they created a lot of uh, environment that where you, you, you can develop an agent that will interact to the environment. So, so the very first thing that uh, it, so the agent, the learner is going to do is do an action right, to the environment. So, so that means why it is doing an action to the environment? Any idea why it has to act to the environment? To get some feedback? Yes, that's the feedback. And actually, uh, you can consider that feedback uh, analogous to the supervised, semi-supervised, all those uh, other learning paradigm is to collect data, right? I mean, so the agent, so we, the learner itself needs to collect data. And that data is essentially the feedback uh, that it go, uh, gets uh, from the environment. So and it, it it so that's that's the point and so okay so let's see. Um, so yeah professor can it be said that the agent performs the action in an environment to get rewarded? Yeah. So uh, so uh, yeah. So yeah. It, again. So if it does an action, it will get a reward. And uh, so here, that's the point. So if you if, so this agent does something to the environment and uh, someone or maybe that agent has a sensor or some some sense some policy uh, that uh, that will tell that this is a rewarding action okay so it, it needs to know that I mean so every action should have a rewarding interpretation and by, by saying say so, if I go right or left maybe there is no reward but if I fall into a pit, maybe you, you, I'm just looking at these uh, environments. So see, this is a maze, right? Uh, if you go to a pit or maybe uh, uh, consider that a Pac-Man style environment, right? So if you are being eaten by uh, an opponent or maybe some adversary, uh, that's a negative reward, right? Maybe it's a, the reward value is minus 10. But if you can get out of that maze, uh, you get positive 10 points. So you need to get that, I mean, very rudimentary. So this is not uh, rocket science to define what type of reward I need to, I need to be getting and uh, so what, uh, how our action is need to be interpreted. So, I mean, very common uh, rewarding is if I see the goal, uh, I mean, if my action takes me to the goal state or goal point where I needed to be to solve that particular problem, I'm done. I'm, uh, so that's, I mean, so I may get a 100 uh, as a reward, right? If I uh, fell into trouble, maybe I need to, uh, I, maybe the reward actually, the, the, the term sounds of the opposite, right? It's, it's not going to be a reward. It's a penalty or something, right? But anyway, so using the same reward value, uh, if you negate the reward value, what would happen? It's, it's essentially the neg negation of a reward is a penalty, right? So, so using a single variable, we can maintain all these rewarding uh, dynamics. 
uh, in the learning process. So again, uh, so the reward, uh, so you get a reward. So for every action that you take into the environment, it needs to, so your agent will interpret this as a reward. And, and by taking an action, you move, say for example, in the, so for example, these uh, states, so you were here, okay? Maybe this is this is the point. So I am here now. Okay. So if you go uh, go to the left, maybe this is okay. So uh, if you go to the left or right, you will your position will change, right? So we we call that I mean the uh, the change of state, right? So and and maybe if you uh, if you're in, depending on the environment, maybe if you do something. And maybe say break a wall uh, of the maze. Your environment gets changed, right? So that's that's a couple of things that you need to uh, understand. So you you get a reward, and you get uh, the environment to change, right? So and then you by learning this reward value and also the state, uh, the new state, uh, you take the next you you make decision to take an, another action. And you, this process gets repeated until you understand that uh, this is, uh, uh, I mean, your goal is to maximize the reward. So that's all it counts, right? So, uh, so again, say for example, uh, I mean, maybe, okay. So here, I'm not sure whether it's easy. So say uh, if you, the environment uh, tells you, actually depending on the environment, uh, so for this particular environment, the goal is to get out of the maze. Maybe you are somewhere here. Maybe I need to use a different color. Yeah, so maybe you are here, okay? So you need to get out. So uh, so at the beginning, you have no idea what the maze, is, uh, maze looks like, right? So what you need to do is take a random action. Uh, and maybe here you go here 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 i'm just drawing some points but anyway so maybe here you see a dead end if it is a dead end if you if if you see there is no available action say maybe in a chase game the environment tells you that you're checkmate right so there is no action that you can take no eligible legal action that you can take so in that particular case definitely uh, you need to be awarded uh, you need to be awarded very, very negative points uh, for the reward value. So that's your episode. We call that uh, the term episode. That means the one, I mean, the, or maybe a, a relay or uh, a one game. So you started from that point and you finished at a dead end. So, so when you have that uh, state, the game is done, right? So that's one episode is complete. Next, you'll again start from the initial position and, uh, and, and again, you repeat doing that. I mean, not the same point, maybe since you at the beginning, you will do randomly explore the environment. Uh, since you know that that way, in the previous episode, you learned about that there was a dead end, you might not take that if you exploit that knowledge that you learned from the previous episode. The reinforcement learning agent works this way. So this is the overview of reinforcement learning agent, that it uh, does an action. Uh, so there is an algorithm that you will uh, you'll see uh, that will, so at the beginning is gonna be totally random action, but as it learns the reward and see the state changes, uh, it, it, ha it will develop a knowledge base inside. I mean, yeah, there is essentially, uh, the agent needs to learn uh, which way to get uh, the maximum reward. So in this way, as it runs a lot of games, I mean, lots of episodes this way, it, it can solve this particular maze really relatively well and fast. So, uh, so once the learning is done, so um, you, you can put it anywhere in the maze, uh, it, it can get out uh, of the maze uh, with the maximum reward. Yes. Uh, so, Professor, I had one question. Um, is there any limit on the number of episodes that that should be done with for an agent? 
like sometimes it happens in machine learning deep learning models um sometimes having a high number of epochs also ruins the model somehow um but is that a case here is so there... here yeah, it is similar uh, the number of epochs that you run actually uh, this is an iteration iterative process so the more you uh, explore more you run the loop uh, the better uh, the knowledge will be but at at certain point actually there is a guarantee uh, that at certain point uh, you'll see that your knowledge doesn't change much when we call it actually in other machine learning uh, learning paradigm we call that convergence uh, so if you see that happens here as well you don't i mean there's no point to learn i mean running another episode right so that's uh, that's something that i can tell for now mm -hmm. okay thank you okay so uh so here we, we we learned about so this is the actually uh, whenever you will uh, you are presented a reinforcement learning algorithm uh, make sure that you understand this picture we don't we don't feed any data uh, externally to the agent uh, the agent works on itself to learn from by acting on the environment uh, to see the rewarding a reward value and also it needs to know actually the state the idea of the state actually state defines characterizes the position of the agent actually what uh, the agent uh, is located at uh, in an environment and uh, it defines essentially the environment and uh, the, any action the agent does it changes the current state of the environment uh, okay so uh, okay, uh, so this is something very, very interesting, which probably you might have learned about the Markov property. Uh, so reinforcement learning stand, uh, algorithm, I mean, stands on the very concept of Markov property and Markov decision process. Markov decision process, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, now, actually. Uh, the environment for reinforcement learning agent uh, is can be defined i mean very well defined using markov decision process i'll, I'll describe about markov decision process uh, in the following slide uh, but what it is actually markov decision process is a a bunch of random it's a, it's a set of random variables you know about a random variable what is a random variable can anybody define what is a random variable Yeah. anybody yes can i say can I? yes yeah it's a um, it's a variable whose outcome can be one or zero something or something random yeah so um uh, any any uh, variable flipping uh, point yeah. Or tail. yeah so any any variable uh -huh. that uh, may change values yes is a random variable and uh, yeah. uh, we we i mean uh, so the domain what omit uh, mentioned is zero one it can be anything i mean uh, so the range i mean the domain uh, that I mean, what is this called yeah. uh, it, it can be integer it can be real number it can be continuous uh, continuous it can be distant yeah. so, any, 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 so if if any, any anything which is not constant is a random variable right so if it is a pi pi is not a random variable because we know the value of pi right because this is constant from uh, the eternity it will stay the value 3.141 and so on and so forth right so random variable is nothing but a constant uh, variable right so a uh, constant value it's, it's not a constant value so it uh, so the value changes so uh, a process so i'm not talking about markov decision process a process in in a um, if you'd like to define what is a process uh, is a set of random variables, it's a collection of random variables. And uh, if all the random variables follows Markov property, so if you're unfamiliar with the term Markov property, uh, probably I have a slide for it. Maybe, yes. Oh, I'm... okay. So Markov property is like, so, uh, this is a very well saying, or maybe I should say this characterizes the property, Markov property really well. So if the future is independent of the past given the present so if you uh, know the present value you can predict i mean <coughs> you can you can characterize the future uh, i mean 
so if you see that <coughs> if you know bunch of variables so you you are familiar with this type of probability notation right yeah <coughs> so this is conditional probability right i'm sorry uh, maybe it's easier if i write it here so say probability of a given b <coughs> right so so a is uh, so we, we are talking about the probability of looking at or the value uh, or the value of a given the on on the condition that b is present right so uh, so so this is a conditional probability that you see so if you see that uh, so here and the states so every single time that you do action uh, in the environment your state changes and your first state was s1 second state maybe after you do second uh, action your environment gets changed and it changed to s2 and and so on and so forth so for every action uh, the environment is changing so s3 and so on and so forth uh, so here, as you see, that we're essentially finding the conditional probability. So essentially, this is a figure. It, it tells that if you know all the previous states, say, for example, here, this is st, and this is st plus 1. Actually, this is the very next state. So we're finding the conditional probability of st plus 1 given the history of that states right if you know all these history so here you see that marco property tells that if you know all this history is the same as if you know the present i mean we, we don't need we, i mean it it, it simplifies uh, these independence i mean this type of uh, knowledge uh, representation a lot right you don't need the the st minus one all the way to the beginning of time uh, so it simplified that so if you know the present value uh, the conditional probability of st plus one it it is actually equals uh, to that i mean which is which might not be the reality but anyway so this is actually a reinforcement learning agent works really well fairly well if all the random variables in the decision process markov decision process works and follows this property and uh, it, it, it again it simplifies a lot a great deal uh, in the in the in the region uh, in this area so again a markov decision now you know about okay so now you we can come back and see actually define the markov decision process so markov decision process is nothing but uh, a process having a bunch of random variables actually at this point maybe we we can only focus on the states right so state is a random variable uh, it, uh, i mean it, it may so a state might be a collection of random variables and maybe if you if you consider uh, if it is a an image say for example this maze right if you consider this is a an image right it has a bunch of pixels each pixel might change right that means each pixel inherently is a random variable right so that's it so you you get so your s is a collection of random variables so say the very first top row so the pixel p 0 0 then the second pixel p 0 1 so on and so forth so you if, it, if this is a hundred by hundred pixel image you have uh, 10,000 hundred by hundred what it is Ten to the power four Yes, uh, so did I? Okay, so one more zero. 10, one 000, more, yeah. Right? yeah. So, t so 10,000 random variables. So, S is a collection of random variables. And if, and, uh, and all these random variables follow Markov property. So, nothing is changing based on all the state values for that particular point. Uh, we just need the present value, and then we can, uh, we, we can see the dependency. Uh, uh, based on that, I mean, we can condition these based on the present value. So, that what should be the next uh, state value for? I mean, state value for this particular uh, variable. 
uh, we can just condition on the previous just uh, I mean I'm what I'm saying actually let, let me rephrase that so if you know the current present value of all the 10,000 pixels you know uh, you, you can find the con uh, find the value actually in a way that you can relate the next state value after the second next action takes place uh, so p00 p01 you can uh, find the conditional value conditional probability value for each individual point just given only the pre present value so that's the holy grail of mark markov property and it it greatly helps and it works and in, in, in practice you'll see, you're gonna see actually today i provided a jupyter notebook although i didn't have any plan to demonstrate that but anyway so i'm, I'm gonna do that but again uh, if i expect that uh, by next class, yeah, you're gonna run that and see actually. And also, slide is already given. It's uh, I believe that's easy reading. Uh, it is gonna help you to uh, uh, to understand uh, the the remaining um, lectures because this is the fundamental principle you need to know uh, before we do anything, uh, any learning on the reinforcement learning agent. Again, uh, so so a Markov decision process. So wherever you see a process, uh, okay, hello. So whenever you see a process, oh, what is happening? So whenever you see a process, uh, you always see it's a collection of random variables. Uh, and all the random variables follows Markov decision, uh, Markov property. So that's why we call it Markov decision process, MDP. Uh, now you are no stranger to this. What is going on? Okay, so so we now know about the Markov property. Okay, so since there are states uh, in a Markov decision process, uh, so if there are states, uh, you know in the, uh, so one state, if we do action, it will go to another state in the next action. So what is the probability of going from, if you were, in a say p00 what happens uh, <clears throat> something is wrong so okay let okay so if you are in uh, some state say you, you are in maybe it's easier okay so if you are in state s uh, and s is connected to s prime which is the next state so, so we call this a transition probability. Yeah. What is the probability that if you are in state S or state A, uh, what is the probability that uh, you go to state B? Uh, so that's it. And also, and you, you always see that actually uh, the from state A, how many uh, other states that you can go to? I mean, what are the possible states that you can go to? I mean, they all the states are connected to each other. I mean, you can consider if there are four states. Although we have 10,000 states in that particular maze example, but I mean, uh, let's uh, go to uh, that scale later. But if you consider, say, there are only four states available, all of them, I mean, from every state, you can go to every, every other state. So you need to count actually what are the probability from one state to go to each individual state. And also from a state, you can also stay on the same state. So you will see, you'll see loop uh, uh, is also possible so if that's also a transition if you are on state so at certain time if you're in state uh, a in the next state you can be in state a okay you can remain in state a but you need to calculate the transition probability so here you see that this particular matrix p the p is a transition probability matrix so p11 you need to calculate what is the probability that if you were so at certain time, so at time t, you are in state one, and at time t plus one, you are in state one. Okay, so what is the probability of that? So that's, uh, that value is gonna tell you about that. So this p11 is gonna tell, uh, it contains that value. So, and now you fill up all these values, all these transition probabilities, and you calculate that transition probability matrix. We, we call it, that and you can see and you can verify that uh, the sum of all rows i mean some of the first row 
is going to be one because you are essentially counting. So from one state, you can go a bunch of states, right? And nowhere else, right? So there is no gap uh, or hidden states in anywhere. So if you just sum all these up, should be one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so again, so now Markov decision process, again, one other, I mean, again, rephrasing actually, or maybe formally defining a Markov decision process or Markov MDP uh, here in this particular cane is just a tuple. You are familiar with the term tuple, right? Tuple yeah. is, a, is a collection. I mean, so here you see that uh, it's a two set. Uh, so S and P. S is a set of states that you have that defines the environment. It can be pixels. Uh, it can be phone numbers. Uh, if you just, uh, if it is a guessing game, uh, I mean, you, you, I mean, you define the environment with sets, uh, with states, right? And P is we just talked about that. I mean, we have a bunch of states, and uh, we know the transition probability from one state to the other, and we calculate the probability, the transition probability matrix, so P. So S and P defines the Markov process. So as that, S is a finite set of states and P is a state transition probability matrix, which is defined by that. So that's it. So Markov decision process is the key ingredient of the reinforcement learning agent. Uh, and it, it, it stands on, its foundation is based on these. Uh, and, uh, and you know that why is it necessary to learn about Markov process, Markov decision process, because uh, we can go anywhere without that. Uh, we may need a new theory, uh, but at this point, we, we don't have any uh, other than that. And it, it, it works perfectly. It works beautifully uh, uh, if you just assume. So these are a couple of assumptions in uh, reinforcement learning agent that if I mean, all the state variables, the P, S, and P, they all fall, uh, follow Markov property. And that's it. So I believe I'm running out of time. So. Uh, if you have any questions, maybe uh, shoot me messages in Canvas. Uh, I hope to see you next class. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I like that hot dog versus not hot dog yeah. chat comment. You're into Silicon Valley, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll see you next class. Bye.